Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Bing Ouyang. I'm currently a postdoc working with Professor Gerber and Steeder at the University of California, Berkeley. This is my channel for sharing my understanding of material science. I will post either my comments of some recent papers, uh, sharing my knowledge about material science, especially computational material science. So in today's video, I'm going to continue this mini workshop about using VASP to do DFT calculations. In the first video of this series, I have a brief tour about, you know, like what is the basic of density and functional theory, as well as some basic knowledge of using VASP to do DFT calculations. So today, I'm going to follow this path and introduce a little bit more knowledge about uh, doing DFT using VASP. So I'm going to focus on a specific topic, which is called electronic structure. So if you have watched my first video, you're going to remember these slides where I give an overview about the typical types of calculation that we usually use VASP to do. So those include actually energetic calculations, dynamic calculations, and electronic structure calculation. So the third part, which is electronic structure calculations, are something actually unique for those quantum-based uh, calculation methods, which includes density functional theory. So if you compile DFT with force field molecular dynamics, or finite element analysis, this is going to be something unique for DFT because it will not only give you the total energy of a system, it also gives you the electronic states of all the electrons in the materials. And you can use that to analyze the behavior of the materials in the electronic scale as well as analyze the electronic structures. So as a beginner of DFT, you sometimes may be confused about those terminologies and different types of plots of the electronic structure just that are generated from density functional theory. So you're probably gonna be confused by those terminologies like you know like bond analysis, electronic states, which includes density of states and band structure, as well as some redox. Uh, capability analysis, polarization, magnetization, and electronic excitation states. So today in this video, I'm going to summarize uh, some typical electronic structure representation that you're going to see in those DFT papers and give a brief introduction about how to understand those electronic structures. So. Let's first review a little bit about the Cohen-Sham equation, which is the master equation that we're going to solve when we are running any DFT code. You know, like if you look at these equations, you're gonna realize actually the first variable that we're gonna obtain after we're finishing this self-consistent loop is actually the electronic, the electron density, which is actually the n here in this equation. So in that case, electronic structure is actually the first uh, variable or the first uh, solution that we're going to obtain before we actually get the total energy of the system. So in that case, um, the different electronic structures is actually only differs by the way they represent in the electronic density. So that's the first knowledge you want to have in mind. So here I kind of summarize these three types of a basic or actually the major uh, representation of electronic states. So which includes density of state, which in nature is actually the energy levels versus the population of the electronic states. The second one is the band structure, which is actually the energy levels versus a reciprocal space. The third one is charge density, which is the population of the electronic state as a function of the real space coordinates 
So in, in other case, in, in other uh, in other words, it's actually the electron density distribution in the real material. All right. So in the later slides, I'm gonna summarize uh, the basic types of each of these representations. So let's start with the density of states. So as I mentioned, the density of states by nature is actually the energy level versus the population of the electron state, right? So here I give example which I took for materials project, and if you check materials project for the materials ID of MP2815, uh, you're gonna get a um, density of state like this. So this is actually the electronic distributions of molydisulfide uh, in an energy range of around minus three to 4.5. And the absolute value of the energy here is actually the, um, uh, the energy levels taking the Fermi energy as a references. So this is typically what we do. It's like we need to define the references of the energies, and then we use uh, the calculated eigenvalues from the T and to align that with these reference energies. And then the x-axis is actually the population. So usually a peak demonstrates that we have a large amount of populations of a specific electronic state. Well, empty, which in other words zero, demonstrates that there is no electrons on that energy level. So this is only the total density of state, right? So we actually can decompose it in different ways. So there are basically two ways. The first one is atomic projection. The atomic projection of a density of state is going to enable you to look at the contribution of different species to the total density of state. So here I use example that I have published in the references above. So if you feel interested, you can go to that paper for more details. So this is a projected density of state of molybdenum disulfide on top of a copper substrate. So in this plot, you can actually project, or in other words, decompose the density of state to the contribution of moly atoms as well as the sulfur atoms. So in that case, you can analyze the contribution of different species to different parts of the density of state. For instance, if you're interested in the composition of the conduction band um, minimum or valence band maximum, then you can plot the density of state in this way. Then you can have a clear evidences about uh, what are the dominated state in the CBM or the VBM. The second type of projection is actually the orbital projection of density of state. So in that case, uh, if you only care about the orbitals, for instance, um, in molydisulfide, the, you only care about the transition metal d orbitals. So in that case, you can plot only in the d states and that are decomposed from the total density of state. Again, I use the same materials in the same paper, but in, in this case, I decompose them into the s orbital, p orbital, and d orbitals. So then you can visualize the contribution of a specific electron in a certain orbitals and analyze the contribution of that electronic state to the overall band structure. So those are the, basically the two types of ways that you want to do some detailed analysis of density of states. The second type of representation of electronic structures is actually the band structure. The band structure by nature is actually the energy level versus the reciprocal space. So the reciprocal space is actually a Fourier transformation of the real space. So here I give example of a typical band structure, again, from the same materials of molydisulfide, and I downloaded this image from materials project. And a typical electronic band structure is gonna have the x-axis being aligned the reciprocal space, while the y-axis 
being the energy state, which is defined the same way as the density of state. So the reason why we call them band structure is because we have this kind of electronic band. And the reason why they have this kind of a band shape is because when we visualize the band structure, usually we only sample a specific line in the reciprocal space instead of sampling the whole reciprocal space. In that case, you're going to have a 3D band structure, right? So uh, you, you, you actually have 3D or even 4D band structures. So when we only sample a line, usually it's called high symmetry lines. You're going to actually end up with a band while every single point of the band refers to a specific electronic state. So in that case, we can have a direct overview about the dispersions of different energy states in the solid materials. And we can analyze things like the band gap, as well as, you know, like the band gap transitions, whether they are direct band gap or indirect band gap. So similar with the density of state, because the density of state actually count the populations of electronic states in different energy levels, right? But the band structure actually plot, you know, like the distribution of the energy states at a certain energy levels in the reciprocal space. So naturally, they're going to have similar ways of decomposition. So we have, of course, the atomic decomposition of the band structures. Well, here I give examples uh, of, from my previous publications. So this are uh, actually the band structure calculated from a graphene boron nitride in plane uh, hydro structures. And I have the overall band structures, uh, which both spin up and spin down on the left and right side. And in addition to that, I also have the circles, which refers to the atomic projections of the eigenvalues in the band structures. So in that case, we can clearly see the contribution of the defective electrons to the overall band structure. So similarly, we can also project, you know, like the orbitals in the band structure. For instance, here I give example that I took from the references. You know, like the authors in that paper want to look at, you know, like the distributions of the hybridized sp orbitals as well as the dangling PZ orbitals in a single vacancy calculated graphene materials. So in that case, they actually do the same projection, but now on the electronic orbitals. And from the notes in the plot, you're going to see that actually the two bands in the middle of the band gap actually are dominated by either the hybridized sp orbitals as well as the dangling PZ orbitals. So the projection on the orbital will actually enable you to analyze, you know, like a specific type of bonding configurations or a specific type of electrons. So in addition to these two types of projection, another thing you may want to know is actually uh, different types of band structures. Uh, when you actually create a different super cells, before you do DFD calculations. So here I give example, you know, like the blue lines are actually the supercell for graphene. Uh, in this paper, the authors actually make a four times four times one supercell for graphene monolayer. Well, they're gonna give you a very different band structure if you compile with the black lines. The black lines are actually the primitive cell of a graphene, a monolayer. So this doesn't really make sense if you take a first glance at it, right? Because these are exactly two type, uh, the, these are exactly two same materials. The only difference is like the first materials, which is the blue lines, are a supercell of the second materials. Because of the periodicity, they should look exactly the same. But the reason for that is because when you do DFT calculations, vast does not really recognize uh, your, your real primitive cell. Thus, we're going to take the input structure at the primitive structures. So when you do the samplings in the k-space, it's going to take 
the reciprocal space of a supercell. So we know that reciprocal space behaves inversely compared with the real space, right? So when you make a supercell the real space, what happens in the reciprocal space is like the reciprocal space is going to be shrinked. So in that case, the original K point in the primitive cell now shifted to some other point, which are no longer the high symmetric point. So one example here is like, we're going to expect to see a linear dispersion in the K point for graphene, but this is actually absent when you are using the graphene supercell. So this is some problem that you want to pay attention when we do this band structure calculations using the supercell. And one way to actually, you know, like return the band structure to the most physical one is to, this, to do this kind of uh, band unfolding. So again, I use these references from MPG uh, 2D materials as an uh, example. You know, like this is something we have uh, met very often when you create a defect in the materials. We have to use the supercell to avoid this image interaction of the defect, right? But as, as a consequences, you have to force yourself to fold the band structures. So the band structure you calculated are not equivalent to the real band structure that you can visualize in experiment. So one way to do that is actually to know um, the supercell matrix that you have, and then you do some post-processing of the even values of the calculated band structures, and then unfold it back to a primitive cell. So here I give example that I unfolded a supercell of a molydisulfide on top of a metal substrate. And because I, I, I need to make it commercialize with metal substrates, so in that case, I create a supercell for molydisulfide. And then I'd like to compile that with experimental measurement of the band structures, uh, which is called OPRAS. So the band unfolding enables you to generate the real band structure that is comparable with experimental observed band, uh, band structures that when you are doing this r -pass analysis. So if you're interested, you're welcome to check this paper for more details. So the third types of electronic structures is charge density. So the first one, the second one, are majorly, you know, like the energy distribution as a function of the reciprocal space, right? But sometimes we just care about what happened in the real space, especially when we do something related to, you know, like a bond forming or like the charge distribution among different species. So in that case, we really need a charge density. The charge density is actually the population in other words, the density of electrons in the real space. So a typical charge density looks like this. So because it's a 3D isosurfaces, so usually we take a 2D contour of it so that different colors actually demonstrate different densities of the electrons. And there are also different versions of the charge densities. We can also decompose it in different ways. So the first way of decomposing it to decompose it into different energy range. Here I give an example that, you know, like I have a density of states. We know that we have the distribution of the energy levels as a function of a different uh, magnitude of energies, right? So sometimes I'm just, you know, like I care about only the states that are close to the Fermi level. For instance, here I give an example. If I only care about the states uh, which is within 0 0.5 electronic volt below the Fermi energy. So in that case, we can project the charge density, which actually includes the electronic density of all valence states, now only to the state that are close to the Fermi energy. So in that case, you can obtain the projected charge densities, which in VASP uh, is called partial charge. So this is going to enable you to analyze, you know, like the shape of the bond, which has the energy levels close 
to the Fermi energies. So on the other hand, this also can be compiled with some experimental observations, for instance, like the scanning tunneling microscopy, because the way the STM works is actually to inject electrons to the surface of the materials. So the only electronic state that interact with the prop gonna be those states that are close to the Fermi energies. So by transforming the partial charge from a certain energy range of, of the materials, gonna enable you to reproduce some of the STM observations. The second type of decomposition is a band decomposition. We will be able to actually decompose each of the bands in the band structure into a charge distribution in the real space. So mathematically, it's just a Fourier transformation, you know, like from the reciprocal space, uh, which is actually the high symmetry k point, and to the real space, which is the whole unit cell that you are calculating. So here I give examples, you know, like the left side gives you the span structure of the materials. Well, you have those colored lines demonstrating some uh, bands that we are interested. So we have actually on the right side, the corresponding charge density of each of the band that we colored on the band structures. So this kind of analysis is going to enable you to actually analyze you know, like the specific contribution of atoms and also the charge distribution of a specific band that we are interested in. So in addition to that, we also have this most commonly used type of charge density, which we use them to analyze and visualize the bond forming of the materials, which is called either deformation or difference charge density. And this kind of a calculation is basically the differences of the different charge densities. So you really will calculate the charge density of the materials before the bond is forming and also after the bond is forming. So then we take the differences of the charge density distribution. It's basically of a, a minus of two 3D matrix, right? So in that case, we're gonna get the actually the deformation or actually the charge transformation after forming a specific chemical bond. So here I give example about, you know, like, I just want to know how the iron atom in the lithium iron silicate want to form oxygen iron bond in the solid. So then we can do this kind of a deformation, charge density calculations to demonstrate the shape of the electron that forms this ionic bond between the iron ion, uh, iron ion uh, with actually the oxygen ion. All right, those are the three types of a basic representation of electronic structures. So there are actually other representations of electronic structures that you can obtain from uh, DFT calculations using VASP. So here I give three examples, like we can get electron, electron localization function which actually measures uh, whether the electron is localized in some chemical bond or not, as well as, you know, like the electros electrostatic potential, which directly measures, you know, like the energy levels of electrons in a real space. And sometimes they also do this excited electronic structural calculations. This uh, which is correlated to the uh, optical absorption spectrum that we can see both in experiment and DFT calculations. And this is actually also related to the empty bond and the possible electronic transitions that can happen in the electronic structure. So I'm not going to elaborate more on those um, on this, uh, electronic structure properties because they are somewhat like more advanced electronic calculation analysis. But if you're interested, please feel free to read those references that I provided in the video. So that's pretty much I want to show for today. I hope those informations can be helpful to you, especially when just start when you just started doing DFT calculations using BUS. And thank you again 
for uh, your watching of my videos. If you like it, please feel free to subscribe it and like this video. Thank you again for your time. Uh, I will see you next time.